In the prior lecture, we learned about partial pressures. Here, we're going to apply our newfound knowledge of partial pressures as it applies to gradients that exist in the body. So quickly, let's revisit the whole purpose of the pulmonary and circulatory systems. The pulmonary system's job is to bring oxygen from the atmosphere and through ventilation, bring it into the alveoli where it will interface with pulmonary capillaries. And then we hope that we are going to drive oxygen to move from the alveoli into the blood. And then the blood will circulate that oxygen around to our cells where we also hope that oxygen will be compelled to leave our blood and move into our cells. The converse is true for CO2. CO2 is produced as a byproduct of aerobic respiration. So as a waste product, we need to get rid of it. We hope to compel CO2 to move into our blood. And then once it gets back up here to the alveoli, we hope that we can compel CO2 to leave our blood, go into our alveoli so that it can be expired in the next breath. In order for a gas to move between two compartments, like between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries, there must exist a partial pressure gradient that favors it. Namely, the partial pressure in the alveoli of oxygen must be greater than the partial pressure in the blood or the gas will not move. So in order to oxygenate our blood, we need a favorable partial pressure gradient. We need the partial pressure of oxygen to be greater in the alveoli than it is in the blood. Likewise, in order to get oxygen to move from the blood to the cells, the partial pressure of oxygen in the cells must be less than the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. If it's not, then there's nothing that is compelling oxygen to leave the blood and go into the cells. So this lecture aims to just briefly introduce you to the partial pressure gradients that exist around the body so that we can see that in fact, oxygen is compelled usually to move from the alveoli to the blood and from the blood to the cells and the converse is true for CO2. So we're gonna be working with this simplified diagram of the circulatory system. Please take a moment to pause the video and copy this down. You need to make it large enough that you can actually write numbers in these spaces here. So don't make your drawing too small. All right, we are gonna start by looking at how the partial pressure of oxygen changes as we move between these various environments. So I'm going to use purple for my partial pressure of oxygen. I'm going to start with the atmosphere, and then I'm gonna to move to the alveoli, and then I'm gonna to move to the pulmonary blood as it leaves the capillaries, enters the pulmonary venules, and then finally the veins. And then it will more or less stay constant as it moves through the left side of the heart into the systemic circuit. We don't lose very much oxygen until we move to the cells. So I'm also interested in what the cells are, and then I'm interested in how that systemic venous blood is going to look when it leaves the cells, how much oxygen is in there, and then coming back up here. So we're gonna start with the atmosphere. The partial pressure of, of oxygen in any airspace can be calculated as the total pressure multiplied by 21%, which is the percent of oxygen in the atmosphere. At sea level, the atmospheric total pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. So when we multiply that by 21%, we get 160 millimeters of mercury. Obviously, that number can change based on elevation. If you go up in the mountains, that number will be less. Oxygen, through ventilation, is going to move into the alveoli. 
you might expect that the partial pressure in the alveoli is equal to the partial pressure of the atmosphere, but that's simply not true. And this is because there is stale air in the alveoli that is depleted in oxygen. So let's say that the starting atmospheric pressure of the alveoli after holding your breath is actually 50. I'm just putting up a number here. If I take a breath and I add some of this fresh air in, I'm still mixing it with the old air. And so the final partial pressure in my alveoli after inspiration is not going to be 160. It's going to be somewhere in between 50 and 160. So here, ventilation patterns absolutely impact the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. But let us assume that we are at rest. And if we are at rest, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli tends to be around 100 millimeters of mercury. And again, this is assuming that we are at sea level. Okay. The partial pressure of oxygen in venous blood coming back up tends to be around 40. And again, we're assuming somebody is at rest here. So when this blood, which is currently oxygen poor, so I'll go ahead and make it blue for oxygen poor, comes over to this alveolus with a partial pressure of 100, that's a gradient. 100 is greater than 40. So oxygen is going to be compelled to go into the blood. If oxygen is compelled to go into the blood and it reaches equilibrium, so this is equilibrium from a partial pressure standpoint. Remember, we are moving from air to fluid. So it does not reach concentration equilibrium, but it does reach an equilibrium. If we assume those pulmonary capillaries do reach equilibrium with the alveoli, then whatever the partial pressure is in the alveoli is transferred to the pulmonary circuit. So we are going to say then that the pulmonary circuit here, the pulmonary veins, are probably going to be about 100. Different books will use different numbers. I've seen some use 95, showing that maybe it doesn't reach exactly equilibrium, but it gets pretty close. So somewhere in that range. Very little oxygen is going to leave the blood as it moves through the pulmonary veins, the left atrium, the left ventricle, the systemic arteries, systemic arterioles, until it gets to the capillaries. And again, that's largely because the blood is moving quickly and the diameter of the um, vessel walls are too thick to really permit very much diffusion. So we can still assume that down here, the partial pressure of oxygen is probably going to be between 95 and 100. And now we hope that the oxygen is going to move to the cells where the cells will consume it with aerobic respiration. So your cells actually have the lowest oxygen percentage in the body. And they work around a partial pressure of 40. Notice I have a less than or equal to sign. So at rest, cells have a partial pressure of oxygen of around 40 millimeters of mercury. If you are exercising, you're doing more aerobic respiration because you need to produce more ATP. And so the partial pressure of oxygen actually drops. So during exercise, the partial pressure of oxygen would be less than 40 because your cells are consuming more oxygen, so there's less of it. Is there a gradient here? And the answer is absolutely. 100 or 95 is greater than 40. So we do expect that oxygen is going to move 
from the systemic capillaries into our cells. The blood in the capillaries has the slowest velocity, and this usually allows the blood and the cells to reach equilibrium, such that the partial pressure of oxygen in the venous blood here is going to match whatever was in the cells. So we'll go ahead and say that this systemic venous blood is going to be whatever the cells are, so that's going to be less than or equal to 40. And then again, the partial pressure of oxygen doesn't really change until we get back up into the pulmonary capillaries where it's exposed to the alveoli. So this shows you how the partial pressure of oxygen changes between the environments. So let me ask you a question. Where is the partial pressure the highest? The atmosphere. Where is the partial pressure the lowest? the cells. So hopefully you can see that we actually have a significant drop off. Now as a very quick little side tangent, as an embryologist, we grow embryos, human embryos, for couples hoping to um, deal with issues of infertility. So we actually take eggs, human eggs, and we um, inseminate them with sperm. And then we have to grow them in special culture medium that is supposed to approximate the environment of the fallopian tubes. So there was a lot of work done on trying to figure out, you know, which chemicals, which nutrients, what the pH is of the fallopian fluid. And one of the things that they realized is that if you just try to grow these embryos at in ambient air, the oxygen concentration is 21%. But and that's a partial pressure of like 160 millimeters of mercury. But the oxygen concentration in our cells and in our fluid right down here is not. In other words, if we expose these growing embryos to atmospheric oxygen, the partial pressure that they were exposed to of oxygen was 160, and that was far too much. They needed a partial pressure of about 40. So one of the things we have to do when we grow up embryos is we actually have to modify the gas exposure and we can't let them be exposed to ambient air for too long because the oxygen concentration is too high. They do best at an oxygen concentration between 5 and 6%, which is much closer to a partial pressure of 40. Okay, so now let's briefly take a look at CO2. So I've started with a blank slate here, and I'm going to use green for CO2. So I'm actually going to start my discussion down here where CO2 is produced. So remember that CO2 is produced in the cells as a consequence of aerobic respiration. So it's, the, it's a waste product. The partial pressure of CO2 in the cells has kind of a minimum value, but it can go up. And that is going to be greater than 46 millimeters of mercury. So the CO2 levels in the cells obviously can increase, just like the oxygen levels can decrease. The more aerobic respiration that's being done in a certain time frame, the more CO2 you're going to produce. So during exercise, we expect that our cells will produce far more CO2 than when we are at rest. Okay. We want that CO2 to basically get dumped into the blood. So clearly there must be a gradient. Interestingly enough, the gradient isn't nearly as strong as it is for oxygen. And this might seem a little weird at first, but it will be explained in more detail when we get to our final lecture of respiration, which is the acid-base balance and CO2. So I'm going to say that the CO2 in here is around 40. Again, not a huge gradient. So I'm hoping then that my CO2 in my systemic veins is going to be 46 or a little bit higher, depending on how much was produced. Again, we expect our systemic capillaries to reach equilibrium with the gas 
partial pressures in the cells because those systemic capillaries have the blood move through so slowly there's plenty of time to reach equilibrium and so now that co2 is going to come up here and it's going to come to the alveoli where we expect at least some sort of gradient in order to get our co2 out interestingly enough the gradient of the alveoli is also not that great so typically, and again, this can change based on ventilation patterns, the CO2 levels in the alveoli are about 40. Now, what's really interesting about this is this is a lot more CO2 than what you would get in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, the CO2 levels are closer to 0 0.3. So in other words, a lot of the CO2 is retained in our alveoli. And while there is some gradients, it's not a huge amount, not like oxygen. There is a very compelling reason to want to keep your blood CO2 levels at about this. And it has to do with your blood pH. CO2 is a major regulator of blood pH as we will see in one of the final lectures. So just kind of go ahead and think about, hmm, that's really strange that our CO2 levels in our blood are kind of purposefully kept high. I know when I first learned about this, I thought it was strange. I would think it's a waste product. You'd want to get rid of all of it. Why would you want to keep it? But there is a reason why we do want to keep it. And major issues can occur when we don't keep enough of it or when we keep too much of it. So we'll be talking about those in later lectures. In the book, there is this diagram here, and it's basically more or less exactly what I put up, with the exception of it does not have the atmospheric numbers on it. If you'd like, you can pause and you can copy this down, or you can just use what you already wrote. So I wanted to talk about some things that can change these numbers. And I'm going to go ahead and start with oxygen although the same concepts apply to CO2, but I'm really just gonna focus here on oxygen, which is the one on the left. I can change this number. I can make that number go up, and I can make that number go down. I can change that number through ventilation patterns. Think about it. If you start breathing really deeply, and really hard or often, so you have a higher ventilation rate, you're bringing in a lot more fresh oxygen. And therefore, we expect this number to be closer to whatever the atmospheric number is. At the beach, at sea level, it's 160. If I hyperventilate, I should be able to get that number above 100. Is it gonna go all the way to 160? No, but I can get it up to about 120. If I go up in elevation, that number is probably going to be less. If I hold my breath, that number is going to be less. Assuming that you have good gas exchange between the alveoli and the capillaries in the pulmonary circuit, the number in here should reflect whatever that number is. It should be very close at the very least. Obviously, if you have some sort of disorder or disease that impairs the ability of oxygen to move from the alveoli into the circulatory system, like pneumonia, then that number will be less. Likewise, this number can also change. So this number can change because that is a reflection of your aerobic respiration in your cells. If you do more aerobic respiration, we expect this number to go down. And likewise, we expect whatever this number is to reflect whatever that number is. I mentioned that ventilation patterns can absolutely change the partial pressure of oxygen and likewise the CO2 levels. And so here is an image that graphs how the ventilation patterns do affect those numbers. This is normal. This is your kind of normal, I'm not thinking about it, I'm just sitting here, this is what my normal ventilation rate is, moving 4.2 liters of air per minute. And this tells you what the partial pressure is in the alveoli. So not the atmosphere, but in the alveoli. So 100 for oxygen and 40 for CO2. 
Now imagine that you start ventilating more. So this is, and you're just gonna have to listen to it. It's kind of a, you know, a hyperventilation. You're overventilating for the situation. If you do that, you ventilate more deeply or you ventilate more often, you're gonna bring in more fresh air. And therefore, your partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 are gonna reflect more of the atmosphere and less of the stale air. So you can see that by increasing my ventilation, I get my oxygen levels can be about 120 for partial pressures, and I can bring my CO2 down to about 20. Notice that I really can't get it to 160 like I thought maybe I could. It kind of peaks out at 120. Likewise, if I hold my breath or underventilate for the situation, my partial pressure of oxygen is going to go way down and my CO2 is going to be retained. So that concludes this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to learn about something called ventilation perfusion matching.